Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Rotten Tomatoes is Wrong, the podcast, the simulcast that you enjoy, because I, Mark Ellis, get to host occasionally, but really the star of the show is currently in France at the celebrated Cannes Film Festival. I don't know if you're supposed to say Cannes or can, but luckily we actually have her here taking a break from seeing movies and interviewing celebs. She's going to grace us with her presence here today, fresh off of her hotel's happy hour. It is the one, the only. Jacqueline Coley, is it can or is it con? How do I properly pronounce this film festival? It is the can, can film festival. And can, C-A-E-N, is a city that's in Normandy where it's cold and they make apples and cider. They, I was going to say they make apples. That's... Like they make cider and grow apples and they have lots of cows. It's like cows and orchards. Called okay, Calvados, so that's what region of that's France. what Khan is. So Khan yes. is either a villain from Star Trek. Khan is or... where the Normandy beaches were stormed. That's Khan. That's up there. Down okay. here is the south of France, where there's no tops and there's French cinema. And so Monte I can see Carlo. It, so I can get away with my Americanizing, just like, hey, y'all going to the Cannes Film Festival? What is you can? That is actually that's that is appropriate ish. Are you having a blast over there? I know you do this just about every year. Do you, what's the What's the most fun thing, aside from getting to see the movies, what is the most fun thing about being at the Cannes Film Festival? I mean, honestly, just being, it is a very like different festival for all the good and bad reasons. Like it's cinema feudalism. Like it's just, you see the haves and the have nots. It's a city <laughs> without an Apple store, but there's a Valentina Valentino shop and like Dior. And there's like very poor, like college cinema kids who are like, vive la revolution next to like 60 foot yachts. It's a very <laughs> strange place to be. And honestly, that's the best part of it uh, is to see this just like mix, but everybody really kind of comes for this vibe. And there's been some incredible things that are here, some incredible films that are premiered here from Do the Right Thing and Pulp Fiction all the way to like Parasite. So it is a very dope and storied uh, film festival and I'm very blessed to come as somebody shoots somebody next door. <laughs> well, I uh, I hope that uh, you get to see that little fighter jet movie there tonight too. I know that's a big uh, premiere that's going to be happening at Cannes Film Festival. So Jacqueline's covered all that good stuff for Rotten Tomatoes, but she's lending her talents to us here today. As we do every week, we're talking about a movie that maybe the tomato meter, God forbid, got wrong. The one today as we celebrate the release of Jurassic World Dominion, which is closing out this new trilogy of Jurassic Worlds. We're talking about the OG, well, kind of, the OG Jurassic World, not Jurassic Park back in 93. I think the tomato meter nailed that one. But this one, Jurassic World, came out in 2015. It's fresh, which is the good news, 71%, which isn't necessarily eye-popping. The audience score improves a little bit. It's 78%. And obviously, we want to talk about a big movie release or some sort of connected tissue there. But we also are shouting out a fan today who really wanted us to talk about Jurassic World for a long time, and that is Sol Laredo. So Sol, today is about you, but it's also also about our special guest. Now, if we're talking about dinosaurs, if we're talking about splicing DNA, if you find a mosquito in amber, she's the first person you call. Not only is she one of the greatest beer pong players I've ever seen, she might be the Kareem Abdul-Jabbar of beer pong because her shot is unstoppable. She also is a celebrated movie fan, critic. She covers films coast to coast for such outlets as Collider and a bunch of other places. She is the one, the only Miss Perry Nemiroff, the host of Ladies Night, and now she's here. Perry, it is so good to see you again. It's so good to see you too. My beer pong shot is unstoppable as long as the table is within regulations. Don't tell Josh <laughs> McCuga I said that. I hold grudges. <laughs> yeah, we had to get up measuring tape at one point during our beer pong exploits. But you <laughs> love this stuff more than, and everybody loves Jurassic Park, but you just take it up a notch, both in terms of your trivia knowledge of this franchise, and also I, just that you have such a smile on your face when we talk about these movies. We figured you're the right person to talk about Jurassic World with because people get so divisive about this movie for whatever reason, and it might have been the film even more than Force Awakens where people like to argue, oh, you're just taking the same formula and doing it again, or it was so reductionist, or it just doesn't make sense. Some people love this movie. Where do you stand on Jurassic World from 2015? 71% of the tomato meter. Is Rotten Tomatoes wrong? I think Rotten Tomatoes is wrong, and I think that the audience score is a more accurate representation of how good this movie is. 
I do very much understand anyone looking at it and saying, oh, you're just rehashing the blueprint that they followed for the original Jurassic Park movie. That is literally the point of the Jurassic franchise. The idea of watching someone come up with this crazy idea and try to make it happen, but then realize that they were playing God and watching the whole thing crash and burn in front of their eyes, but then proving that human beings learn nothing from their own failures and try to do the same exact thing again. And this is a movie that manages to capture that, that magical quality of seeing a park like that operational. Like when, when the monorail goes through the gate, you start to get chills. And when Gray runs to the, uh, the hotel room window and it opens up and you see what the park looks like. Like I had goosebumps. So you get that, but then you also get man makes the same mistake over and over and puts others at risk and probably shouldn't have done this and all the thrills that come with that. They nailed it. This is the formula it should have run with. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's who you should really get mad at is the history of humankind. I mean, look at our actual history of humanity. We kind of step into the same potholes every so many centuries or every so often. Jacqueline Coley, 71% on the tomato meter. Is Rotten Tomatoes right or wrong about Jurassic World? It's pretty right. It's pretty right. It's pretty meh. It's a good meh. It's on the stronger side of meh, but like, it's not, it's just not all there. It's a cake that needs to be in the oven a bit longer. It's a cake that's got a doughy center or a soggy bottom. I've been watching a lot of British Bake Off. It sounds that's like what you it have. Is. And that's what that it is. It's like, it's is... just not quite there. I okay. do like my cookie cakes a little undercooked in the center, though. So maybe that's why this movie speaks to me. And you will eat this up. And I would say <laughs> most people will eat it up. And the issues I have with it are not the normal issues. Like, I have different issues with it. And it's more like, it's the thing I say often. I have questions. I have so many questions. And the heels don't even, like, tip the iceberg. That is the oh. easiest question. That is the easiest question. And that right there is enough. If I'm telling you the easiest question that I have for this movie is the ding dong hill we're going to die on about her running in heels. The fact that that was a question is my question. I want to talk about the ambiguously ethnic duo. I want to talk about the fact that we murked the girl for basically being a snotty assistant. I want to talk <laughs> about all of the NBC product placement and Jimmy Fallon in the ball. I want to talk about all of those things. But anytime I see that park opening shot, I'm like, this is genius. I'm in. I'm in. I'm in every time right from the word jump when I get those feels that Perry is talking about. I agree with Jack on some of the issues and we'll get into the running in heels. We'll get into a lot of the other issues that some people have with Jurassic World and about that assistant who gets ripped apart unceremoniously. We do have some research on that. So there's a lot coming up here on the show. I'll just say I think Rotten Tomatoes is right for the most part with 71%. Very enjoyable movie. It was great to be back in a Jurassic-ish world. I didn't love it, but I really had a good time watching it and shoving a lot of popcorn in my face. Before we hear from Tim Ryan, who is our expert review curation manager here at Rotten Tomatoes, he's going to tell us what the critics were saying at the time of the release back in 2005. Was it really seven years ago? My God. Jacqueline Coley is going to give us a quick synopsis of Jurassic World. Jacqueline, what in the hell is this movie about? All right. So Jurassic World, we pick up after the events of all of the Jurassic World parks, kind of, in the sense that, <laughs> yes, we live in the Jurassic World, like, legacy, but we're really only referencing back to the very first run. In this new world, Jurassic Park has opened. After all of the death and destruction of the first film, the corporations found a way to turn it into Disneyland for dinosaurs and make a buck. And it is open. We get to see it. And we follow this family of some, you know, likely soon to be divorced kids. They're they're taking like one last sort of holiday, I guess, as it were. It, it is all in all, I would say, your typical we're going to put a family in a situation in a dangerous setting. And in that dangerous setting, they are guided through this by Bryce Dallas Howard, who works at the park. And it is her job as the aunt to sort of like keep them safe and keep them uh, through the park, even though she's very busy basically being the Steve Jobs of Jurassic Park. It is owned by um, Ifra Khan, his character. He plays a sort of Indian billionaire maverick. And during the course of the events of Jurassic Park, we come to realize that the animals essentially 
are breaking out. And we meet the Chris Pratt character, who is the animal trainer, who has been trying over several years to train the raptors to be members. And the reason why they've all escaped is because of this great, big, giant, stupid bit of product placement called the Indominus Rex. And they literally say, like, Verizon Wireless brought you the Indominus Rex. And that's what's escaped. It's too smart to be a dinosaur. And the dinosaur has got out, turns into a horror movie. Dallas Bryce Howard runs in heels. The most awkward kiss in cinema. Roll credits, start the franchise. That is exactly how you would write the video jacket for this movie back in the day at Blockbuster. And I do love the idea of the Indominus Rex being sponsored like boxers used to paint goldenpalace.com on their back when they were fighting so they get a little bit extra cheddar. Indominus Rex, you got to pay the bills, all right? It's hard for an Indominus Rex out here. So you're welcome to all the corporate sponsorships you can land. Wonderful synopsis there. So now for what the critics were saying at the time of the movie's release, Jurassic World, here is our own Tim Ryan for a segment we call Two Minutes with Tim. There was no way on earth Jurassic World could possibly measure up to Jurassic Park. Steven Spielberg's 1993 classic was a technical marvel with eccentric characters that were in some ways as memorable as the awesome set pieces. Judged by those impossibly high standards, critics felt Jurassic World couldn't help but fall short. But a majority still thought it played the blockbuster game pretty well. Its effects were awesome, its action sequences were exciting, and the performances were solid. Jurassic World is fresh at 71% on the tomato meter with 356 reviews, and it has a 78% audience score. So what did the critics have to say? In a fresh review, Chris Nashawadi of Entertainment Weekly wrote, While the new Jurassic World pales next to the awe-inspiring spectacle of the original, it's easily the franchise's most thrilling sequel yet. However, in a rotten review, Dale Rowe of the Austin American Statesman wrote, The park is bigger, the genetically modified dinosaurs are bigger, and the inevitable blockbusters' problems and disappointments are bigger, too. The Rotten Tomatoes critics' consensus reads, Jurassic World can't match the original for sheer inventiveness and impact, but it works in its own right as an entertaining and visually dazzling popcorn thriller. So that's Jurassic World. Let's kick it back to Jacqueline and Mark, two folks who didn't ask for reality, but did ask for more teeth. Back to you folks. I mean, (laughs) you can never have enough chompers in a movie. We were so preoccupied with whether we could, Tim. We didn't stop to think if we should. But I think we should go ahead and hit the movie talk button because let's talk about Jurassic World. The question right out of the gate. I think it's a fair question to ask, but I will defer to our esteemed guest here, Perry Nemiroff. When we think about Jurassic World, is it even fair to compare Jurassic World as a film to 1993's Jurassic Park? Or is that such a sacred film going experience that nothing could ever compete with it? So why bother? I think it's absolutely fair. And if anyone out there does not think it's fair, maybe they shouldn't be making sequels or playing with an existing franchise at all. It's inevitable, it has to connect. But I do think that there's a little balance between comparing it to that original, the original, which in this case happens to be my favorite movie of all time, but also being open-minded and waiting for the franchise to grow and do different things, which is inevitable. and. I feel like this one kind of hits that balance pretty pretty damn well, like maybe even just short of perfectly in my mind. As someone who absolutely adores the original Jurassic Park, I knew that certain things with, with atmosphere and with characters and with the style of the VFX even, I knew they were gonna have to change. But as long as you change them in a way that still plays well and feeds into the nature of like little Jurassic Park, big Jurassic World, bigger problems, then it's gonna work for me. And it certainly did. Mo dinos, mo problems. Mo dinos, mo problems. (laughs) That's the thing, more dinosaurs. You got more issues, but I will also say this. I feel like when Perry says balance, I think that's a great description of Jurassic World's brilliance is that it does look back at the original 1993 film. I hate when critics say this, but I'm going to do it anyway. It's a love letter to the original Jurassic Park. But in equal measures, I think it does make a concerted effort 
to move the war forward. And that gets into particularly Chris Pratt as a dinosaur trainer, where it's like back in the day, you, we're not training these things, but Chris Pratt kind of like, he's got some stuff going with these Raptors. And so that does open up a new storytelling portal for me anyway. Jacqueline, is it fair to be talking about the OG or should we just let Jurassic World rest on its own merit? Uh, I don't care about fair with Steven Spielberg. Who cares? Fair, you don't get fair. You, you've made like all those movies, all that money. You're literally your own form of IP. Who cares? He's the EP on this. The movie doesn't get made without him. If he's worrying about it being compared, don't sign off on the project. There's a reason why they haven't made any more Back to the Futures. Like they know that's done. <laughs> they feel they can still get some lemon out of this. They can get some lemon uh, lemonade out of the squeeze. So squeeze, baby, squeeze. I mean, they certainly got a lot of lemonade. The movie broke $200 million just here in the United States on its opening weekend. So let's get into the film itself, because I love when we're talking about Jurassic Park versus Jurassic World. It almost feels like Jurassic World is the finished version of the Death Star that we see in A New Hope. Like this thing's fully operational. It's working. It's clicking. We've seen it work before. It's going to work again. And I feel like Jurassic Park was more like the second Death Star where we're still kind of building it. And we're just sort of testing. We don't really know if it's fully operational yet. Let's just invite a couple of people to kind of check out where we are with progress. But I love looking at this park, Perry. I love looking at this world, I should say, because of all the corporate interest that you, it feels like you're at Disneyland. There's a Jimmy Buffett's Margaritaville in the Lost World, and it tickles me to see that I could go there and get delicious chicken zingers. I can go across the street and go to Starbucks, and then I can look at some dinosaurs. So that's one of my favorite scenes in this entire movie is just seeing the scope of Jurassic World and how accurately they nailed that if this was a real park on Earth, this is exactly how it would look. But that's me. And you know how much I love corporate restaurants. What is the scene for Perry Nemiroff that says, that's why this is a good movie. That's why this movie deserves to be more like its audience score and not its tomato meter. I'll, I'll go back to one that I already mentioned. And it's when Zach and Gray arrive at their hotel room and the window opens. And that, that was the part where it like really like washed over me that I am actually experiencing John Hammond's original vision brought to life in this movie. Can he slow down? Nope. Everyone's got your VIP access, so you can get on all the rides without waiting in line. Let's go! Dude, she said we had to wait. I don't want to wait anymore! To be able to see all, all the attractions and all the stores and, I mean, a really believable evolution of this whole Pro project that he started in 1993, like it all makes sense. And it actually speaks to those two characters too, the two new uh, headliners, uh, Owen and Claire, because of course, as an operation like this would grow, you would have someone out there trying to weaponize dinosaurs because obviously, and then you'd have people like Claire who get caught up in the money-making corporate world of it all and completely forget that these are living, breathing creatures that need care. So I love that kind of stuff, but I'll give an example of a scene that I love because I think it's a great, a great example of how this movie takes moments from the original film and, and, and updates them and puts a fresh spin on them while clearly tying back to the original. And it's the, the moment when Zack and Gray are in the gyrosphere. I love that moment because I love the Ankylosaurus. I don't know if either of you have watched Camp Cretaceous, but Bumpy the Ankylosaurus is just like everything. So that has very quickly become one of my favorite dinosaurs. But also it is a really exhilarating set piece that feels very believable within the world that they've established by introducing us to Jurassic World. But there's also very clear nods to Lex and Tim in the car from the original Jurassic Park. And you know, it's not done in a way where you're sitting there and you're like, look at them playing copycat and recreating that. It's something that feels real. And I think that those kids, their performances are so good and the fear is so real and the way that they frame the Indominus in that scene and the way that they shoot the Indominus and attacking the Ankylosaurus. Everything about that set piece is just built really well. So it gets to have the best of both worlds there. Might be a safer world if we had gyrospheres to travel around in, Jacqueline, instead of cars. <laughs> but that's a conversation <laughs> for another day. What is the scene that Jacqueline Coley likes in Jurassic World? What's the scene where you're like, this is why this is a good movie? I mean, I've, 
already said it, but the opening shot, like, so it, it is definitely what, what Perry did, but I'm very particular about what it is. And that is, that is the Steven Spielberg in the gym in West Side Story. There are certain scenes that directors can set up in these grand sweeping epics that really set the stage for what world we're walking into. And although that one happens differently in that film compared to this one, what it does is exactly the same. And it's one of those things where I'm like, I'm not saying Colin Trevorrow got like Steven Spielberg cliff notes, but it really feels like he got Steven Spielberg slip quotes because that is a Steven Spielberg shot. Like everything about it screams his work. And so if it wasn't something that him and Steven discussed when he was given the job, then it was definitely something that he specifically crafted with it in mind of paying homage to, yeah, again, that that moment that Laura Dern has when she stares at the Brachiosaurus with with the like the glasses coming off like that. That is what makes Jurassic Park incredible because you have to have the awe and wonderment of walking amongst dinosaurs coupled with all of the murder and, and mayhem. Otherwise, it doesn't work. And so when they nailed that, that to me is more iconic. And that is a more difficult thing to nail than, say, a scary moment in the adventure sort of action things. Those can, I think, be recreated more easily. And so that's the scene that I look at it. But again, it's not just because it's John, it's not just because it's Hammond's vision coming to life. It's more what the filmmakers were trying to do to the audience in that moment. And they nailed it. It was just such a great moment of, we're gonna give the audience this feeling, we're gonna plug it into their veins and they're gonna feel every ounce of nostalgia right when we need them to feel it. like. Like it's adrenaline shot to the heart. And that was, you know, uh, very special. It was John Hammond's vision come to life and his John Williams' score come to life in that moment. And then the arm hair starts to raise. But at some point, we do need to further the lore and we need to tell its own story with Jurassic World, which is when we get to my favorite scene. We meet Owen, who is played by Chris Pratt. He's sort of the dino trainer, if you will. And when we get to watch him interact with his raptor buddies for the first time, oh, my God. Now, it, this is in no small part due to the fact that I have Molly the Wonder Dog and she's the rat. She's probably the Owen my raptor let's be perfectly honest here but it just makes me think uh, we're this close and and it shows the temptation of humanity to be like no look these things are so smart we can train them to do stuff that's going to make it a better world maybe not weaponize them but we can't just say oh no the park it, 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 the couple of them got out of the park and they're wreaking having they're eating people. We need to kill every dinosaur because they're like the real things They're It's like if there's a dog attack, if there's a Cujo, you don't want to just get rid of all the dogs. Right. And so you really are rooting for some of the dinosaurs here, too, which I thought was really cool and a slightly different tone than you get with Jurassic Park, because Jurassic Park, as cool as the dinosaurs are like we're rooting for the humans there here. I, this felt a lot more like Rise of the Planet of the Apes, where I, I love my own people, but I'm kind of pulling for the apes and I'm kind of pulling for some of the dinosaurs in this movie. And that brings me to my next point, because the moment that everyone cheered in unison all five, six times that I saw the original Jurassic Park in 93 was when the lawyer gets eaten on, on the toilet. Everybody erupted in applause during that scene but there's a little bit more of a controversial death in jurassic world and that would be the assistant that we touched on zara who's tasked after looking after these punk ass kids who do not want to be there she's got her hands full with them she gets picked up by a pterosaur and then she gets dropped into a giant lagoon only to be eaten by a mosasaurus and a lot of folks think this is way too extraneous of a death. They feel like the character didn't warrant a death that brutal because according to screen time, it's almost a minute that you're watching this poor girl just get ripped to shreds in every way possible. <laughs> Did they go too far with killing Zara in the fashion that they did? 
I'm not going to say anyone deserves an on-screen death like that, except maybe someone like Hoskins or, or an actual villain from the film. Yeah. But we are talking about a monster movie where people die. You need longer set pieces to, to build dread and keep you on your toes and surprise you. And like, if not Zara, who else was it going to be? And really, it's not like she, again, I don't think she really deserved this, but it's not like she was the most attentive babysitter. I'm pretty sure she was talking about a bachelor party at some point when she should have been watching them. But again, maybe she didn't deserve it, but it is a set piece in a movie with dinosaurs. No one knows the horror movie rules better than Perry. So, Jacqueline, do you co-sign that? That because maybe Zara was talking about going to a bachelorette party or bachelor party at some point, that that leads to sort of the losing your virginity, therefore you deserve to get killed by the camp slasher? No. The girl does not get murked because she's basically a babysitter when she should have never been a babysitter. She's Fair. an assistant. She's not a babysitter. She got tasked to be a babysitter because Bryce Dallas Howard's character is a crappy aunt. Like, that's the real facts. And so any, like, slight eye rolls those kids got, yeah, you got a crappy aunt. <laughs> Sorry, she dumped you off on her assistant. But that doesn't mean the girl gets murked. It definitely does not mean that she gets murked the way that the lawyer gets murked in the first one. You're right, that took, it really con recontextualizes that whole first moment differently. We were happy to see the violence on that dude. We were just shocked by it here. And I think that was the point, but I think that right there Remember when I said Colin Trevor was reading Steven Spielberg's Cliff Notes? That right there is like, this is why this is a Colin Trevor or Ruby. This is the same guy who decided that murdering the neighbor was like the way to go from the Book of Henry with Naomi Watts and made her literally turn into like atomic blonde John Wick assassin because the girl got touched. The girl that he got the hots for. It's the weirdest movie ever. And uh, it is so misogynistic. Don't make me do this. Don't make me start so defending the Book of Henry again, because I'll do it. No! I, I haven't seen it since it was released. We'll, we'll talk about the Book of Henry at the end of the show. But if we get back to Jurassic <laughs> World, Perry, it, it seems like Jacqueline's almost leaning to towards the point of maybe Claire should have been the one to go and not Zara. No. Should Claire have been ripped apart no. and not Zara? No, because all... Also, I think Claire's, Claire's arc in the trilogy is one of my absolute favorites. I love seeing how much she changes and how much she learns from this experience. But, you know, again, like Zara is a sub, like a sub, not even a supporting character, like the tiniest role in, in a movie with dinosaurs. But also that particular sequence and the way it plays out literally like in a minute shows you the food change. Like, look at these teeny tiny humans that are like little ants running away from these creatures. You can get swooped up in a hot second and then think, oh, no, this is the worst it could get. But really, there's a bigger beast out there that can not only crush the teeny tiny ant that was in uh, that was in harm's way to begin with, but can also Eat, eat up in a single bite this other creature that you thought was extremely dangerous. So I feel like that right there is just like amplifying the threat that the world is going to have to deal with if these monsters get out into the world, which eventually they do. That girl did not deserve that. She did not deserve that. She I'll just never did say not, she deserved it. I'll never say she, did she deserved it. She did not deserve it. that. And the choice to do that in such a big, loud way Again, what is the point? It is not about the food chain. It is weird and weird. It was rough. It was rough to, to rewatch because I knew it was coming and I was like, oh yeah, that one really does hurt. But I will say it, it is a nice illustration of some of the new dinosaurs that we get to meet and toys and merch that we're going to want to buy as soon as we leave the theater. If we talk about our favorite characters, if we talk about not necessarily the Zaras, because justice for Zara, fine. She was never my favorite character in the movie, but Chris Pratt is up there. My favorite character in this movie, though, because I do need my comic relief in a Jurassic World kind of movie, and I like that this nodded back to the original in a fun way, was Jake Johnson as Lowry. Because Jake Johnson, I, I just, I love the way he talks. I love his intonation. He is a, he, he's just so naturally gifted at delivering lines comedically. And I also love that he got an original Jurassic Park shirt that he found on eBay. And I just thought that was like a, such a fun ode to the original films merchandising because everybody had a Jurassic Park lunchbox or something back in 93. And so that was just kind of like a fun tip of the cap to merchandising back in the day. Who's your favorite character in Jurassic World? Perry Nemiroff, we're going to start with the humans and then we can talk okay. about the dinos. 
Well, I'll plus one for Jake Johnson as Lowry and also Lauren Lapkus as Vivian. I'm just always into the control room type setting and just learning what it takes to run a park like that. But I just love that in their cases and the way that they bring those characters to life, you could tell that they really care. And anyone in that movie who presents as a person that really cares about running a operational Jurassic World Park is always going to speak to me, but also highlighting Jake Johnson's work even more. He's so good in that role. There are certain lines that he has to say that, or like moments that the two of them have to play out, like that really awkward moment where he tries to kiss her at the end, but their delivery makes a moment like that funny and makes it work instead of landing with a thud. But I'll go back to something I already said. I just love the addition of Claire. I love Bryce Dallas Howard in that role. And I'll get into the heel debate with you. I'm very ready for that. But I mean, I'm not. You can win on that one. I don't care. I just wish we didn't have to talk about it as much. Like, I really am not that interested yeah. in it. But fair, well, fair enough. Let's rip this Band-Aid off then. Let's just get these heels talked about because I, I watched it. And my first thought after, like, all the hubbub about, oh, she's running through the jungle with heels. It's like, look, I'm a dude. I've never had to wear heels in my entire life. I do not really feel like my opinion on this conversation is the most important because, again, never had to wear heels. So, Perry, why don't you settle this debate once and for all? You have the floor as to the heels wearing in the jungle, running away from dinosaurs in Jurassic World. First off, I despise heels. Personally, I think they should never be worn anywhere because I'm extremely uncomfortable in them and would never wear them if I had a choice ever in life. Other people have different opinions, and I respect that opinion. In this particular case, though, Bryce Dallas Howard is playing a character who is high up in the corporate world of Jurassic World. So she wants to present as such, especially when she has people coming in who could potentially sponsor the Indominus Rex. So that is a day where I imagine she shows up at work wanting to look her best. But then on top of that, the movie very well explains that she is someone who is completely out of touch with the type of park she runs and the types of animals that she works with. It makes all the sense in the world that she would show up to work dressed completely inappropriate for the realities of the job. And that's what happens. And she realizes that she works with what she has because really there wasn't an opportunity for a shoe change over the course of this movie. But then she learns from it and never wear, wears heels again in the rest of the franchise. Yeah, your option is is what I've seen a lot of young ladies do from time to time, leaving bars as they're like, screw it, I'll get my feet dirty, and they just take their heels off as they're walking to their Uber. That is not really a viable play if you are in a Jurassic World setting, in my humble opinion, because look, it, it, as Bryce Dallas Howard has been quoted as saying, you could get tetanus there, but also like when I take Molly for a walk and it's cold outside, it doesn't matter what I'm wearing, it's just about the layers. So any layer of protection that your feet have from the natural environment around you is a good thing, and Bryce Dallas Howard also said she didn't want to knock just the heels off, which is what a lot of people were saying, because that was done in Romancing the Stone and she didn't want to copy it. So she has every right to wear heels because of who she is and what role she was playing in the film. And boom, the gavel has been thrown down. The ruling has been made. It was OK for her to wear heels. Jacqueline Coley, let's talk about your favorite character in Jurassic World. I'm going to let you pick a dinosaur if you want to. No, I don't have a dinosaur. Um, I mean, there's like the second movie is actually the one with the ambiguously ethnic duo and the brontosaurus dying, which is probably one of the oh, saddest moments in cinema ever. Like, me. I just, I still get sad about it, just thinking Ooh. about it. So I want to confuse those two. So I would say my favorite character, just because she had a great line read and like the, the like pop-in guest star that she has been throughout the 90s and 2000s and just like the best friend to the lead, Judy Greer. I, people do not understand her talent and her power. And I really just wish people did because she came in and got a quote that's in the trailer, basically a throwaway intro. These are the kids that are about to die. <laughs> like there's no reason for her to even be in that movie. It's like, it, there is nothing there. It's supposed to be maybe an emotional thread to be like, we got to get home to mom. But like mom is an idea. Mom is not real. But she, the way she says, you know, she's just like, I don't know what the quote was. I think it was just like, uh, you know, they bite, you know, and she like, like chomps down in the trailer just like that. I got to figure out exactly what if that quote was. If something chases yeah, you, she, run. Run. That's what it was. Yes. Yeah, so if something chases you, run. And she says it just with that like bite in her voice. And it was just like, run, 
It was so great. It was everything. So I really love her in this. But I would also say that there's a lot of other folks who are very talented, who did not have a lot to do in this movie that I wish had more to do. And I would say Omar C is one. Folks will recognize him from Lupin and some other. Uh, Ifra Khan is another one. Like, that's the other thing that, like, why do you cast these, like, iconic people and then give them barely anything to do? And, like, they finally gave B.D. Wong to do after not giving him something to do in the first one. But, like, it doesn't excuse you doing literally the exact same thing to a whole bunch of other people who are very talented that are in this film that essentially it seems like are diversity window dressing. Sorry. Yeah, the the, the B.D. Wong storyline as we get further in this trilogy really bothers me just because like I, I, I love B.D. Wong and like I, I don't think B.D. Wong as I know that person or any role he's ever played would, would do something like this as far as like, yeah. kinda, you know, eh, maybe massage some dino DNA. But we do get a great villain in this film. And I, I think that Vincent D'Onofrio plays this military general as uh, whatever he is he he wants to weaponize the dinosaurs he wants to use them because he wants to be the greatest power on earth he wants to he wants them to go fight the wars instead of soldiers i understand where he's coming from but it's a horrible angle the guy takes and he deserves to get ripped apart it's the human villain presence that we need oh yeah he's clever girl yeah yeah so what was that guy's name which, which one are you talking about? The clever girl, hunter dude. What was his name from the first one? Because that's the Vincent D'Onofrio oh, character. Bob. What's his name? No, it's not. Bob, no. Bob Peck's character is like... He, you don't he's, think that's he's like him? A, no, because he, he's like a, 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 like a safari hunting guy who's literally oh, doing just... what he's doing in that moment to protect the humans. He's not looking to actually hurt... Like, he wants to... He wants to put the license contingency into action in order to save the people that are lost in the park. He's not trying to harm harm the animals or use them for nefarious purposes. See, Vincent I disagree. Vincent D'Onofrio is basically Vincent D'Onofrio is is completely like like he's completely out of touch with what these creatures are. He has a goal for what he wants from them and has no understanding of how you get from point A to point B. And he'll put anybody at risk in order to get what he wants in the end. This is this is some deep character <laughs> study we're getting into here, and it does make sense. And, and as far as Vincent D'Onofrio's character goes, I think much like Jurassic World, everything has been heightened from Jurassic Park as far as the stakes and as far as the scope. That is the next gen baddie to somebody like the lawyer who's like, oh, we can make a lot of money on this park. This guy's like, no, we can conquer the freaking world with these things. And so I like that extrapolation. And you're just you're you're so hard rooting against this guy. And we do get a thrilling sequence where the Raptors are kind of chasing in the in the jungle at night. And it's another one of the great parts of this movie as we get towards the climax that leads me to my other and last favorite character in this movie, the Mama T-Rex. We get the Mama T-Rex back and it was like watching the, the, the Millennium Falcon fly again in Force Awakens. It was so great to see the Mama T-Rex back. Do I get any pushback from either one of you that the mama t-rex should not have been involved in this because i love seeing her back i'm like trying uh, to hold back judging anyone from saying she shouldn't have been involved i mean i, I don't know moment. if she should or shouldn't been involved but it does feel very much like the eagles at the end of lord of the rings i will say that she had some very <laughs> convenient appearances yeah but the eagles seriously could have done that at any point throughout the lord of the rings the mama t-rex has other mama t-rex things to do the eagles are literally just that. sitting there you know. I didn't say that, but I will also, again, I just don't know how else to say it. That, 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 that dinosaur popped up every time at the right moment, like Godzilla. They literally, in the middle of the Jurassic World movie, took that 2014 Godzilla movie that had Brian Cranston, where Godzilla would just show up at the right times to fight the other monsters. Do y'all not remember this movie? That's what they did to the, that's what they did to Jurassic. Well, that's what they did to the T-Rex. I was just like, I don't know. Why are you going to make the T-Rex a secondary character? It's a T-Rex. I feel like if the Rex had just like waltzed into the, the main area to save the day uncalled for, then I would have been like, I don't know if you really are in that moment. But the paddock is legit right there. Gray gives Claire the information in order to spark that idea and turn that light bulb on. And because of the original film, she knows exactly how to get it out of the paddock. Lowry had already stepped up and said he was going to stay behind. So there's someone there to open the gate. They literally just paved the way to being able to have that be a believable moment. And then when you look at the, at the nature of creating dinosaurs in this movie, like it makes 
Not that any of these dinosaurs are 100% accurate, but it makes total sense where like the purest forms of them, the Rex and the Raptors would have to team up to take down this monstrosity. Like nothing can do it alone, but if you all do it together and realize something's wrong with this one, then you can do it. All I will add is we are literally going so deep on a movie that literally thinks dinosaurs can walk among us. And like anyone listening who is saying that, I'm with you. I know, welcome to every movie theater. Yeah. There's mosquitoes in amber out there. I believe There's mosquitoes in amber. Do you really think that, oh, this is my question. Sorry, Mark. Do you really think Jurassic World could happen, Perry? Not in my lifetime, but I'll tell you, I've learned nothing from these movies. If there was a Jurassic World, I would be the first in line to buy a ticket and walk into that park. After Dominion, and, and we all see Dominion and that closes out this trilogy, where does Jurassic Park world go from here if it goes anywhere? Should there be another movie? Would it be a proper reboot? We might wait 10 or 15 years and then we're all a little older and crustier, but we're still excited to talk about movies. Are we ever going to get another Jurassic World? Is it just too big of a monster to put to sleep permanently? Where should it go? If Dominion makes another billion dollars for a studio, like I don't think they're going to be able to stop themselves, and I don't blame them. It's a it's a massive money maker, and it's a franchise that I adore. So I will never say no to more Jurassic. I wouldn't mind seeing them pump the brakes a little bit, though, just to give us time to you know really soak in what we just witnessed and maybe to assess how people respond to this and and what the best path is forward story-wise. I'm also really curious to see the last season of Camp Cretaceous because I'm curious if that's going to reshape what I want from the story going forward. But I think I think ultimately if I had my choice of stories to tell, I might embrace what Colin Trevorrow did with his short film Battle at Big Rock. There was something about that in particular, above all of the new movies that we've gotten, that really just like that to me tapped into the atmosphere and the feeling and, you know, the family adventure, but the horror of the situation that we got in the original Jurassic Park better than almost anything that I've seen. So I wouldn't mind seeing maybe a more contained story playing out in a world where dinosaurs and humans exist side by side. That's a great answer. And I I think it's probably a true answer because like, there's no way if this movie does do the business, the first two in the new trilogy have done, it's hard to say no to that. You might wait a few years, but you're going to have to do something. And I just hope that that something is palatable and is original and gives us the time to digest what we have just witnessed with this new trilogy. So that is going to close up shop here for Jurassic World and our conversation therein. I think if I had two passes to this and I'm going to call to zoo whatever you want to call it pretty sure i can get i know i know perry's gone perry will have already been but i'm pretty sure i can get jacqueline to go all i'm saying i'm pretty I mean, sure I'll go. i can get jacqueline to go see there it is they have a margarita yeah, i'll booth. go yeah no and by the way i don't hate these movies i'm just still unsure at this point if we needed them and i'll res- i will reserve my final opinion until i see dominion and i see the ogs come back if they do that well I may forgive the rest because in all honesty, I think my biggest issue is just the lack of Jeff Goldblum. (laughs) I I love his cameo on a book jacket in this movie. Now (laughs) let's transition to mailbag. God, I now now I'm just excited to go to Jurassic World. And I do think there is going to be, I don't know. The the actual T-Rex had feathers. In history, the actual T-Rex had feathers. Everybody digest that. While I read this email from Fresh Ketchup crew member Bruno Santos. Hey, y'all can be like Bruno. We don't talk about Bruno, but you can be like Bruno. And you can email (laughs) us your thoughts on a movie. Which films do you want us to talk about on an upcoming episode of RT is Wrong? That's our email. RT is Wrong at RottenTomatoes.com. And Bruno says... Hey, Rotten Tomatoes, all the way from Portugal. I want to drop a movie suggestion for your podcast. Rotten Tomatoes is wrong. Empire Records. I was very much surprised. This movie is only 29% on the tomato meter and a huge 83% on the audience score. What a gap. Up and coming actors like Renee Zellweger, Liv Tyler, Robin Tunney, a great music score and a very special place in my heart as this is the first non-animated film I remember seeing. Keep up the good work. Compromentos. Bruno. Thank you for the email, Bruno, and the suggestion. Empire Records. Do we have any Empire Records stands here on the show today? Perry, Jacqueline? Did you pick this on purpose? 
I I have never seen this email before. I've been aware that there's a big fan of ours named Bruno. Did not know this was his movie pick. Are you a Empire Records gal? Well, you do know what band I discovered through Empire Records, right? Would it happen to be the Gin Blossoms? Yes. That's one of my favorite bands of all time. The first time I ever heard their music was in Empire Records. I listened to that CD over and over and over again. I also rewatched that movie over and over and over again. And it's a movie that still has my heart to this day. This is probably one of like the the highest ranking repeat watches in my life in general. I adore Empire Records and 100% agree with the audience score on this one. Jacqueline, Empire Records, yeah or nay? Uh, Empire Records is great. I think obviously that score, it's a, okay. It's like hard. It's a teen movie. I get it. It's a teen movie. There's a reason why I liked it. I, I don't know if it's as great as it is in my heart. The same way I don't know if Can't Hardly Wait means anything to anyone else or a movie like Waiting means anything to anyone else. Like I know this movie is very specific to me as somebody that graduated in the late in like the early 2000s. Like this is my ish. So, yes, it's amazing. But all right. Here's my hot take on Can't Hardly Wait. Fine movie. I like it. You know, the, the bully character. It's nice to see Jennifer Love Hewitt. I hate the fact that they play Paradise City and it's like this forgotten song that nobody remembers anymore. It's like everybody knows Paradise City. Have you ever been to a sporting event? Have you ever turned on the radio for 10 minutes? You know what Paradise City is. It's like, oh, I remember that song from 100 years ago. It's not some random doo-wop tune from the 50s. It's Guns N' Roses' Paradise City. The song came out 10 years before the events of this film. Relax. I wasn't old enough to have been exposed to the music before that movie. So yes, that that's movie my whole point, in, yeah. That movie introduced me to that song and therefore introduced me to a slew of other fantastic music that I would not have experienced without Can't Hardly Wait and that particular <sighs> scene. That's a great Dude, comeback. There's so many, there are so many artists that introduced me through movie soundtracks. And yeah, I think Blink-182 was, I think, on the Harold and Kumar soundtrack. So mm. was Rolls Royce. And that was the first time I heard them. I didn't know who the hell they were before that. And I was like, oh, look at this. Okay, uh, that's, yeah, so that's my I, I'm gonna is, I'm gonna say that. I'm so sorry, Mark. Yes. I have to think of the 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 movie that introduced me to a band that I love. I'll, I'll get back to y'all on that one. In the meantime, uh, that's how Perry and I communicate. Is if, if the Gin Blossoms <laughs> are on the radio, I take a picture and send it to her. She takes a screenshot of Van Halen songs, sends it to me. Yeah. I have never seen Empire Records, so Bruno, this is a great <gasps> suggestion. And I know, I know, I'm seeing the reaction. If you're watching along with us on Peacock, you see Jacqueline and Perry's disdain for me and everything I stand for. I will rectify the situation and we will talk about it on some future episode. Thank you for the email, Bruno. Again, y'all can email us anytime. RT is wrong at RottenTomatoes.com. And our very own Brian Perez chimes in, our esteemed engineer, and says he loves Can't Hardly Wait. So there you go. Brian loves Can't Hardly Wait. Perry Nemiroff, it's been such a pleasure to spend some time with you and to grace our podcast with your presence, talking about this beloved franchise. Before we tell all the stuff you're working on and where the kids can find you on social media, you said Jurassic Park is your favorite movie of all time. Scream, does it ever enter the competition or is it a firm one and a firm two? It's a pretty firm one and two, and it's okay. always been that way. I'm, I'm pretty confident in that, but I, I will say Scream has very firmly become my favorite franchise of all time, whereas Jurassic is number two in that wow. particular department. Okay. There, Scream's, there's got, nothing... Scream's got more consistency. <laughs> there, that's a fair point. There's nothing more fun than getting Jacqueline Perry and our dear friend Joel Mears in a room together because <laughs> they talk about Scream and I just watch the chaos ensue. Perry, where can everybody find you and in, uh, in all the new stuff that you're working on? On Twitter and Instagram at P. Nemiroff. I am also on TikTok now constantly. Same handle there. Collider Ladies Night is alive and thriving. I'm obsessed with everything, everywhere, all at once. And Stephanie Shu is our latest guest. So check that out. My YouTube channel all over the place. <laughs> Oh, that's if you were if Deputy Dewey were to be named not from your cat, not from the Scream franchise, but from the Jurassic Park franchise, what name would Dewey have gotten? I have thought about this a lot, and I think that Camp Cretaceous has has changed my feelings. And I think that if I ever name a pet after a Jurassic character, it is going to be Bumpy. OK, Bumpy. All right. Every time Can I you hear tell Bumpy. people what Jurassic 
<gasps> crit- uh, the crustaceous yes, because can. like I I was just about to say I don't think everybody knows what that is and you mentioned it a few times so I was just gonna say let, give folks a quick log on what that is I didn't want to veer off a path I shouldn't have but I would be so thrilled to do that so Camp Cretaceous is a spin-off of the Jurassic World film franchise and it's animated it's available on Netflix and they're winding down with the the next season I think late in June it comes out and it's basically about a group of kids who go to something called Camp Cretaceous which exists in a different part of the island and while they're there the events of Jurassic World happen and they get trapped on the island with dinosaurs and let me tell you, you will, you maybe will look at the animation and think this show is just for kids and I'm not gonna be able to connect to it at all. The connectivity between this series and the film franchise is really smart. These kids are dealing with like really human challenging issues and it explores so many of them with like really great grace and thought. And it's, just, it's very powerful. The cast chemistry is through the roof and they do some really clever things with dinosaurs too. I'm so impressed by that series. All right. And that's our streaming recommendation. I'm assuming when I watch this show, yeah. all of the kids have proper footwear to deal with dinosaurs in the wild. It's it, we already put the we already put the argument <laughs> to bed, everyone. We already put she was she had every right to be wearing heels in Jurassic World. So uh, check out our new show cast. We have a lot of new shows that you can actually get through our podcast feed now, including Rotten Tomatoes Binge Battle, which I host after show, which Jacqueline hosts. Unless she's doing something really cool, then I'll step in. Uh, we, we, it's a big family here at Rotten Tomatoes, and it really is a celebration of movies. And we love talking about them with you all. So thank you for the incredible co-host known as Jacqueline Coley. Have a wonderful time in France. Let me know what you think of that little movie you're seeing tonight and enjoy the free happy hour in your hotel lobby. Our producer, Lucy, our engineer, Brian, who loves Can't Hardly Wait, and of course, our very special guest, Perry Nemiroff. I am merely Mark Ellis. Thanking y'all for watching Rotten Tomatoes is wrong. From our family to yours, life finds a way. <laughs>